So, this is a conference about risk, and, um, I, you know, that's not a normal subject for a Christian conference, but you're not a normal group of Christians either, because <laughs> you're entrepreneurs. And what I'd like to do is start the, uh, the weekend by giving you, I guess what could only be called, biblical reflections on the subject of risk, and probably you've never heard them before. Um, I, have, I couldn't find anything else to... Uh, help me with this talk either. And I'll tell you a couple of reasons why. Uh, let's talk about risk in general, the, the subject of risk. Actually, when you and I, especially most of the people in this room, when you and I think of risk, when you hear people, especially in the business world, talk about risk, we're talking about something fairly specific. Uh, I asked a couple of business people, what is risk? When you hear the word risk at work, what does it mean? One person said this, Risk is the percentage chance that the return on investment will be lower than expected. Which I think is about right, right? Risk is the, the percentage chance that uh, what we're doing will, will, will not give us the returns that we count on and we need. So I need to know how risky it is. Um, do you know that the word risk uh, in English didn't appear until, about into the, until the 1600s? Uh, and some, again, I, I told you I didn't, have, I didn't have a lot of, when I did my research, I discovered there's not a lot of writing on this, not a lot of uh, uh, reflection done on this. But evidently, the word risk is a fairly new English word. And part of the reason is because the, uh, the idea of risk is a fairly modern idea. Oh, of course, we've always known danger. Ancient people knew danger. But the word risk probably came into our vocabulary for two reasons according to the, here's the speculation. One is that the 1600s were the beginning of what's called the early modern era, and the early modern era was the beginning of capitalism. So uh, uh, capitalistic society is very different than ancient societies. Ancient economies were quite different, and the idea of, of investment and expectation of return on investment and the ability to calculate that, that's actually a relatively, in human history, a relatively recent uh, idea or you know concept and so the word risk came in as capitalism was beginning to, to uh, uh, come together but here's another interesting thing uh, in the 1600s, 1700s, especially the 1700s what arose especially in Western uh, Europe especially amongst the elites was the idea of what's called deism some of you may have heard that a lot of the founders of the uh, you know American uh, uh, Republic were deists, like Thomas Jefferson. Now, deism was an interesting thing. Deists didn't believe in God. They believed in a God. And so, in fact, it, it, it enabled a lot of deists to stay within the general framework of going to church and of Christianity. But deists believed that God was not all that involved in day to day. They believed that God, in a sense, created the world a little bit, and this is uh, the metaphor you may have heard if you've ever studied this or heard a lecture on it. Deists believed in the world like a giant clock, uh, that the, uh, God invented the world and now it runs pretty much on its own. It runs according to natural laws and according to natural processes. And there is a God, but he's remote. He's not all that involved. Now that was very different uh, than, than the, the, the predecessor worldviews in the West because the oldest worldview uh, before Christianity was Greek and Roman classical uh, society, and they had, a, they had a pretty strong view of fate. Things were fated. If something happened to you, it was fate. Did you ever see the story of Oedipus? Did you ever read the story of Oedipus? Oedipus was a young boy, and when, he's, uh, when he was born, uh, the prophecy was that he was, he was going to kill his father and marry his mother. That was, the, that was the prophecy. Oh, we got to stop that, right? So his parents, when he was born, sent him away to get killed. But of course, it was a little bit like Snow White and the Huntsman. Somebody didn't kill him. And so he grows up somewhere, and he doesn't actually know who his father and mother are. So eventually, he finds his way back to back home, not knowing that this king is his father, not knowing this woman is his mother. Uh, he gets into a fight, kills his father, marries his mother. They don't realize Oedipus, and afterwards, they do find out about it. And it's called a tragedy, by the way. <laughs> But the whole point behind it is you can't escape your fate. You know the joke about the Greek philosopher who fell down a set of steps and he said, Phew, glad that's over with. So, <laughs> there we go. It took you a while. Anyway, um, the idea of fate meant there was no risk. I mean, 
what was going to happen was going to happen. But you, know, you can't escape it. Now, when Christianity came along, and I'll get back to this in just a few minutes, Christianity also had an understanding that there are really no accidents, that uh, God is in control, that God is sovereign, that he's, in, that he's upholding everything. You know, he holds the universe together. Uh, in him, G, uh, Paul said to the Greek philosophers, by the way, on Mars Hill in Acts 17, in him we speak, we live and move and have our being. So he upholds us, and therefore, in a sense, there's no accidents. Now, we're going to get back to the fact that this is not the same thing as, as classical fatalism, but there was still a sense that, uh, you know, God was in charge. What happened with deism, beginning in the 1700s especially, was you had this, uh, this sense that God was, the teaching that God was more remote. And what that did was it essentially left human beings with much greater room for saying, we can control things. We can manage things with our reason, with our savvy. We can make things happen. Got it? So instead of seeing reversals and failures as destiny, uh, uh, you know, the wheel of fate, or even God's uh, plan for our lives, more and more emphasis was put on human ability to get things done, and therefore risk was something you calculated and you managed. Uh, you, calc you managed risk because you, you made sure you didn't risk more than you could afford to. You managed risk by making sure that you... Uh, you only risk where the possibility of return was, was good, or that you spread your risk out, so you actually lowered your overall percentage of risk and, and so forth. You did everything you could to remove the factors. But you begin to understand that the idea of risk is a relatively modern idea. And it came only as God began shrinking, and more and more people felt like, I can make my life happen, I can make things happen, I can do that. Then suddenly, of course, you have to manage that, and, uh, and there are such things as accidents and disasters and failures, and now we have to uh, uh, be very careful about that. Now, I'm not done just giving you these initial reflections on what risk is. You can't talk about external risk without talking about internal attitude toward risk. Because you have the risk that you're taking, and then you have your, your internal attitude toward that risk. Uh, there is no doubt about it that risk-taking and the amount of fear you have in your heart are intimately linked. If you have no fear of failure at all, you're almost always going to, be, to, to uh, take bad risks or, or big risks or be very uncareful. In other words, if you have no fear at all, uh, you're going to play on the precipice and you're going to do stupid things. So. Uh, you, too little fear in your heart about failure, too little fear of risk means you're not going to be taking very smart risks. But too much fear of risk means the same thing. Psychologists will tell you that if you have a, an inordinate fear of failure, now we have to figure out what does that mean, but if you, the more of a fear of failure you have, the worse your goal setting is. Uh, there was an interesting uh, study I read some years ago of kids, or kids who all had a very high fear of failure, uh, when, when they took kids, boys, they were, by the way, when they took these boys who had a high fear of failure into a basketball uh, court and just let them, gave them all basketballs and just let them take shots, everybody noticed one thing. None of them took normal jump shots. They either came up, they either took layups, which you couldn't miss, or they went way, way out and tried to do three-pointers, that pointers that if they lost, if they missed, nobody would say they failed. The point is, that the more uh, fear of failure you have, the more you either take uh, too few risks, basically, or too big risks. And so what this means, of course, is that the fear of failure and the fear uh, has a great deal to do with how well you take risks, how wisely you take risks, how, um, uh, how well you make your, set your goals. Now, I, for example, I took a look at one, a couple of books and a couple of websites on what do you do, this is, this is your secular books, secular websites, that try to help people who don't feel, they, they, they can't take risks, they, they, they're not venturesome, they're not willing to step out, they're not willing to do initiative, uh, take initiative, make innovation, they're afraid, they're afraid. So what do you do? So here's one, here's one set of, work, uh, you know, here's, here's one set of prescriptions from one website, by the way. Number one, dwell on your past successes and stop thinking at all about your past failures. See, that'll help you get your confidence. Dwell on your successes of the past, stop thinking about your failures, which I think, by the way, is stupid. 
since your failures tell you what you're good at, what you're bad at, you know, oh, okay. here's the second thing. Just do something risky, just to prove yourself to yourself you can do it. Just to get through your fa fear, okay? Just do it. Do something you're too scared to do, just to know you can do it. <laughs> Unless you can't. In which case, <laughs> you're crippled for life. I mean, you, what you've done is, I'm gonna do that just to prove I can do that. Oops, it didn't work. Never again. Um, here's the third one. Uh, if you do fail, just remember this. Say this to yourself. There's no failure, only feedback. There is no failure, only feedback. See, we're learning, which, by the way, is better. Except, you know, who's that, who's that uh, you know, in the Downton Abbey series? Who is the, the Lord of the Manor? What's his name? Lord what? Yeah, I, well, okay, I'm sure. Uh, anyway, the Lord of the Manor, do you remember he, he bets all of the family money on railroads in America? and he loses it all, so they, have to, so they have to lose the estate. Remember that, right? So he should, have, he should have read the website. He could have come back, and he could have said to the lady of the manor and all of his family who'd lived there for centuries, there's really no failure. This is just feedback. This is just feedback. Uh, see, the problem with the modern approach to risk and the fear of failure that makes us do bad risking is... Uh, the secular worldview says all of our problems come from a lack of self-esteem. That's the whole problem. If you had enough confidence, if you liked yourself enough, everything would be fine. But here's the point that I'd like to make. Uh, in some ways, the idea of risk isn't real directly uh, addressed in the Bible. And yet the underlying factors are. What do I mean? Actually, sometimes I, I, I've, heard a lot, I've heard a lot of youth pastors over the year give this, this kind of talk the biblical view of dating. And if somebody ever asked me, if they ever asked me, I'd say, say, what, well, I'm doing this talk on the biblical view of dating. What should I say? I should say, you ought to say there is no biblical view of dating. There's no dating in the Bible. <laughs> Families just made her, you know, the, 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 who you married and who you spent time with was, was never decided by individuals in the Bible. It was decided by families. So there is no view of the dating in the Bible. Oh, well, what are we going to do? Well, the answer is... <laughs> Of course, that the underlying issues like sex and relationships, there's all sorts of things that the Bible talks about that have a great deal of uh, influence on how we do what we do here. Same thing with risk-taking. There's really actually not a whole lot in the Bible about risk-taking because risk-taking, uh, venture capitalism, things like that didn't really exist in those days. But there's two things the Bible says a whole lot about. It talks an awful lot about fear and an awful lot about control. And if we are going to be, as Christians, if you're going to draw on the resources of the Christian faith to make you smart, savvy, courageous, and sober entrepreneurs, you need to know what the Bible says about these two things. Now, let me just briefly, let me, let me take you to two passages, two passages, that one of which talks about the fear and one of which talks about the control. Uh, I'd like to just, and, and I'm only going to look at these briefly, but if you're keeping mental notes or you're taking actual notes, just keep in mind this. Psalm 3, dealing with fear, tells us you have to relocate your identity in Christ's, in God's glory. To deal with your fear, you've got to relocate your identity in God's glory. And then secondly, we're going to look at James 4. And to understand your real level of control, you've got to learn to trust God's providence. So relocate your identity in God's glory, and you have to learn to humble yourself and trust in God's providence. Okay, first of all, uh, Psalm 3. Let me just read these. These are brief passages. I'll just read them. Psalm 3. Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. But you, O Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head high. I call out to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and sleep. I awake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on all sides. So what did he do? First of all, here's the problem. He is actually being attacked physically and psychologically. Physically, evidently, verse 1 says, Oh, Lord, how many are my foes? So people are actually, he's, a, he's the king. This is Psalm 3, Psalm of David. David's the king. And people are out to, he's, maybe there's a real army. Maybe there really are 10,000 people coming to, you know, to uh, assault him. 
So there's the outside physical, but there's the inside. It says, many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. Now, this is an attack on his identity because he's the king. He's not just a person here. He's the king. And the way Israel knew that a particular person was the king was that he was successful because God was with him. And here's what they're saying. I'm not sure that God is really with this guy. And so what David was looking at was this. He says, but you are my glory and the lifter of my head. Now, one great commentator on Psalms, the book of Psalms is a man named Derek Kidner. And Derek Kidner says about that verse, he says, for, for David to say my glory is an expression, uh, pardon me, my glory is an expression to ponder because it indicates the comparative unimportance of earthly esteem. And then he also says that David wouldn't have said, you're my glory, unless his glory had been somewhere else. Now, summary. David was looking at his approval ratings. They were going down. He was looking at his popular acclaim. He was going down. He was looking at his political power. People, his political allies were deserting him. And so all the things in which his glory, his self-image, his self-worth, his confidence, his sense that I'm a, you know, I'm a worthwhile person, I'm a good person, all the things in which his glory had resided were deserting him. And so what he's done is he's relocated his glory. He's relocated his glory. What he's saying is, Lord, you're my glory. Something else has been my glory. It's been shattered. But now I relocate my security, I relo re relocate my significance in you. Now, what this means, of course, is that whenever you start to feel this deep anxiety over failure, you need to realize something very, very simple. If God and his relationship with you, if his love for you, if your identity in Jesus, if your salvation, if his grace, if those things were your real, most valuable assets, then you wouldn't be that afraid. You know why? Because a Christian who's not just a Christian up here, but who existentially says, you are my glory. You lift my head up. By the way, lifting your head high means you make me proud. Why? It's not what I've done. It's not what people say about me. It's the fact that you're my God and you love me. And when you do that, what you mean is this. There's never any risk to your real assets. There's never any risk to your real assets because that's your real asset. And then things can come and things can go. And of course, it's, it's not unimportant. He's not, you don't think David is sitting there saying, well, I don't have to fight a battle. Who cares? You know, I, God loves me and I don't care whether the whole, you know, I don't care whether the entire kingdom falls apart. Of course not. But, but no longer is it his glory. And what that means is, I'm not afraid. He says that. He says, I'm not afraid. You know, I actually use this, uh, Catherine's heard me use it a couple times. Some of you may have heard me use it because I just found it a few months ago. There's this great spot. Uh, there's a, there was a New York Times blog uh, written some, you know, February 2nd, 2013, by a guy named Benjamin Nugent, who was not a Christian person, by the way, but he was a writer. And he, he talks about the fact that he made his writing into his, his self-worth, his glory. He didn't use the word glory. But when he was describing uh, how he was living, when it, his writing was who he was, this is what he says. He says, quote, when good writing was my only goal in life, when good writing was my only goal, I made the quality of my work the measure of my worth. For this reason, I wasn't able to read my own writing well. I couldn't tell whether something I had just written was good or bad because I needed it to be good in order to feel sane. I lost the ability to cheerfully interrogate how much I liked what I had written to so see what was actually on the page rather than what I wanted to see or what I feared to see. That's a great description. If you relocate your glory, and that's hard work, by the way. That cannot just be, you can't just sit down and say, okay, I'll relocate my glory. I mean, it takes prayer. It takes repentance. It takes, it takes worship. It takes singing. You know, it takes sticking at it. It takes daily prayer. Uh, it takes all sorts of things to, or, to really find that you've relocated your glory because then, in some ways, there's no risk to your real assets. 
And as a result, you can move out with, the, with proper fearfulness, proper anxiety. You don't want things to go south. You don't want to lose your investor's money. Of course there should be some anxiety, but it's, no long, it's not excessive. And you're managing your fear. And then you're not going to have goals that are they're too, low, you know, too, too small or too big, too unrealistic. You'll be in a better position. So the first thing the Bible talks about is fear, which has a lot to do with risk and a tremendous Christian resource for those of you who are Christians who are in entrepreneurship, which of course is risky. But secondly, the Bible also talks about, so the first point is, as for fear, relocate your glory in God's glory. Secondly, humble yourself before God's providence. This has to do with the subject of control. Uh, here, let me just read this brief section, but it's, it's a great section. It's James 4. And this comes as close as I can find in the Bible to a direct address to somebody who's a business person about to do a new venture. Listen, James 4, 13. <clears throat> now listen, you who say, tomorrow or t today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. How's that? Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. But you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes, and all such boasting is evil. Now, what's the situation here? Um, he is talking about people within business, and so some of you might say, wow, that is talking to me pretty uh, directly. Uh, but it probably would be just as applicable to anybody with a plan. Anybody with a plan. I mean, you might say, you, you know, he could have said, you who say, tomorrow I will enter school for three years to become a lawyer. Or he could have said, you who say, before I turn 35, I want to be married and start raising a family. Or you who say, I want to be a well-known artist. He's talking to everybody, you know, really. Anybody with a plan. And there's two major mistakes you can make. And we do make. In fact, our culture requires us almost to make it. It just, you know, it, 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 uh, it, it encourages us. The first mistake is to, over, to overestimate the amount of knowledge. See, you do not even know what will happen. You don't even know what will happen. Um, one of the dangers with the risk thing is we do actually, we do feel like we can calculate percentages. That is a modern idea. And as soon as you get a percentage, you say, okay, well, I can handle it. You know, um, especially those of you who live in New York know this, that the year before Hurricane Sandy, there was another tropical storm that was like the biggest one. Remember the, the, uh, you know, the, the water levels? This, the storm surge was way higher than it had been in like decades and decades, remember? And everybody was afraid that we were gonna have flooding everywhere. And it just barely missed really turning into something bad. This was like two years ago, remember? And you remember they said that only happened once every 100 years. The MTA, by the way, did war game type things. Is what would happen if we actually had a hurricane like that? And they figured out what to do with, the, with, the, with their cars and to take them away and all that. The New Jersey Transit did not. Hey, if after all, it's only one every 100 years. And then the next year we had an even bigger one. And the MTA came out looking like smelling like a rose and New Jersey Transit came out looking the other, smelling like something else. And, uh, and you know why? Because I think in some way, somebody at the MTA actually might have known, we don't know. Don't give me that percentage stuff. Life is uncontrollable. That's ridiculous, you know. <laughs> my, wife, my wife, who's, by the way, much more fatalistic than me, uh, Kathy often says, if I say, Kathy, it's just one chance in 100 that that will happen. He says, yeah, but, the, but the, for the person it's going to happen to, it's a 100% chance. How do you know it's not you? <laughs> if it's me, it'll be a 100% chance. If it's not, it's a 0% chance. What is this one chance in 100? I don't get this. And I think, she's, I think she's closer to the biblical mindset on this. You don't know. Not only that, you can't control. See, he's, he, he not only talks about, James is not only saying, you think you know and you don't, but he says you have your schemes. You think you can manage this, and you can't. And see, we live in, we absolutely live in a culture that says you can control things. You can control things. And the Bible says you're not in control. You know, at the end of uh, Back to the Future, remember that trilogy with Michael J. Fox? 
Professor Brown, remember, at one point says, you know, in his kind of way, he says, the future is whatever you make it, so make it a good one. <sighs> Mom, apple pie, America, you know, anything, <laughs> whatever, you can make the future whatever you want it. But then, you know, if you actually find anybody who's done any kind of disciplined thinking about this, like read, which a lot of you have, read Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers, and he'll tell you what makes a person incredibly successful is he does say practice, practice, practice is helpful, but then there have to be the right circumstances, the right timing, the right upbringing, the right culture, the right opportunity, all kinds of stuff. You don't have control. <clears throat> a man named Ernest Becker wrote a Pulitzer Prize winning book called Denial of Death, it's 1972. He's dead now, not very well known anymore. Uh, it's one of the most brutally honest books ever. He says, now that we know there's no God, why won't we admit what this means? And near the very end, he says this. I'm going to read it carefully and slowly, but the last line is the punchline. He says, we, d we avoid despair by building defenses. We who now we know there's no God. He says, we avoid despair by building defenses. And these defenses allow us to feel a basic sense of self-worth of meaningfulness, of power. They allow us to feel that we control our lives and our death, that we really do live and act in a willful free, as willful free individuals, and that we have a unique and self-fashioned identity, that, that we are somebody, not just a trembling accident germinated on an, in a hothouse planet that Carlisle for all times called the Hall of Doom. I have, this is Becker talking, he says, up to now I've called our modern lifestyle, a lie. And now, I hope you can understand why I said so. This lie that we're in control is a necessary and basic dishonesty about ourselves and our whole situation that we have to hold on to. We don't want to admit that we're fundamentally dishonest about reality, that we do not really control our own lives. This is modern people who don't believe in God have to believe we're in control because the alternative is just too frightening. But if you are a Christian, here's what you should do. Three things, very simple. Number one, you need to humble yourself and recognize that you really aren't in charge, that you're not in control of your life, that you can't manage it, that you're really in the hands of God. Number one. Number two, and here, I, I, I told you I was going to tell you about this, and I have to do a couple minutes on this. Number two, though you're in the hands of God, what you do matters. Christians believe in the sovereignty of God, that God is in control, but we do not believe in the same way the Greeks and Romans did about fatalism. And I know this is a little bit, let me just give you a quick example. Uh, Paul in uh, Acts 27, those of you who go to Redeemer, we're going to get there eventually because we're going through the book of Acts. Uh, Paul in Acts 27, there's this fascinating place where Paul's in a boat and um, he's a prisoner with some other prisoners and they're on the way to Rome. And so the boat has both sailors and soldiers. The soldiers, of course, are, uh, you know, guarding Paul and the other prisoners taken to Rome and they have the sailors. There's this enormous storm. The storm is horrible. It goes on for days. Everybody's scared they're going to sink. And at one point, an angel visits Paul and gives him a prophecy. And Paul comes up and says to everybody, God showed me through an angel that nobody is going to die. The ship is going to be wrecked, but nobody's going to die. That was his prophecy. And by the way, you know in the Bible, in the book in Deuteronomy, it says if a, if a person says he has a prophecy from God and it doesn't come true, you should kill him because it's not from God. So nobody's going to die. However, a day or so later, when it really gets bad and the storm gets really bad, the sailors, sneaky, go down to one end of the boat and start to lower a lifeboat in because they're going to abandon ship. They don't think it's going to work. They don't think it's going to last. Paul goes to the Romans and says you bet, to the soldiers, you better stop the sailors because if they abandon ship, we'll all die. Now, wait a minute. Paul said... It is absolutely certain it's God's will that nobody live, nobody die. But here he says, unless we stay in the boat, we're all going to die. Why wouldn't Paul say, hey, let him go. Who cares? You know, it's fated. We're going to live. It doesn't matter. Let him do this. You know, let him snorkel for a little bit. It won't matter because we're, we're fine. It's like, in other words, our fate is set despite what we do. See, that's Oedipus, but that is not the Bible. 
That is not the Bible. That there is a, there is a mysterious but real compatibility between God's sovereignty and yet what we do. Our, on the one hand, we need to work. We need to do. We need to be as responsible as we possibly can. And if we're not responsible, there will be bad consequences. And yet, over the whole thing, God is in charge of it. He's working everything out. And you need to know both those things, or you'll be too passive or too scared. Charles Spurgeon, who, by the way, was a Baptist Calvinist pastor in Britain years ago, he went to see a friend of his, and he said, hey, he was, he was very sick, very sick. And he says to his friend, ah, I've heard you're not taking your medicine. You need to take your medicine. And they said, oh, Pastor Spurgeon, you don't understand. Uh, I, don't, I don't know whether I should take my medicine or not. And Pastor Spurgeon says, why? He says, well, I don't know if I'm predestined to live or predestined to die. And Spurgeon says, oh, I can tell you. Really? Yeah. If you take your medicine, you're predestined to live. <laughs> if you don't take your medicine, you're predestined to die. And you know, that was, that's funny, but it's actually exactly what we have in the Bible. The idea is, on the one hand, your deeds matter. Your actions matter. If you do stupid things, there can be very bad consequences. The Bible's all full of that. And yet, over it all, you've got a God who's controlling everything. They're both true. And the last thing I said, you have to humble yourself and see you're not in control. But you have to also see this balance that between your responsibility and God's sovereignty. And last of all, you have to realize that in the end, you're not in control, but the one who is in control died for you. You're not in control of the world, but the one who's in control of the world is not just a puppet master. He died for you. In fact, when he came to earth, he himself submitted to his father's will. Do you remember that? There's a place where Pilate says, what is the matter with you? This is like in John chapter 18, 19. What is the matter with you? Don't you realize I can kill you? I have the power to, to, to execute you. Why aren't you talking to me? And Jesus says, you don't have any power other than what my Father's given you. See, that's the Lord of the universe himself coming into this world and participating in the scariness of it. And yet trusting God. Trusting God. And so you see, the one who died for you is the one who's in charge, and therefore, you're not in control, and so what? You're not in control, and so what? And therefore, just if you relocate your, your glory, if you get a biblical understanding of how much in control you are, you've got great resources to actually be sober and courageous, you know, wise and bold at the same time.